So this is my new to me ProtoTrack DPM CNC machine. This machine weighs about 4,500 pounds. The machine itself was made in 1996, but the person that I bought it from put a new controller on it in 2020. Uh, the machine itself is in pretty good shape mechanically. It needs some upgrades and some parts changed out on it. And I've actually worked with ProtoTrack to help understand the limits and the tolerance of this machine to understand which parts I needed to replace. So today we're going to be refreshing this machine, putting some upgrades on it, making sure it works, trying to learn how to use it, and uh, getting it back in service. So let's get right into it. All right, so a quick overview of the machine. This is a Track DPM, and it's got a 5 horsepower motor on it, and somebody upgraded it with this Speedrite VFD controller. So this is how you adjust the speeds. Uh, the Prototrack KMX controller is actually the most current controller for the CNC parts of this machine. And this is not a knee mill as much as it looks like a bridge port or my other jet. This is a bed mill. So all the action happens on the Z inside that column. There's a very large counterweight in there that goes up and down uh, using those chains. And you've got full X, Y, and Z controls using the CNC and the servo motors. So we're going to be cleaning this thing up, doing some paint, changing up the hand wheels and making it perfect again. So to start off, this thing was pretty dirty. It came out of a working machine shop up in Massachusetts. I found this on Facebook Marketplace and I basically begged the seller to hold on to it until I got back from a couple of trips to pick it up. A lot of this work is going to be done with some WD-40 specialist degreaser because this thing is just absolutely filthy. The WD-40 specialist degreaser does a great job of breaking up that old coolant and oil and everything else that's just been lathered on this machine for what's probably close to 30 years. The machine was made in 1996, but as I mentioned earlier, the upgraded controller is really what makes this thing worth the money that I spent on it. I got a great deal at about $6,500, plus I had to pay some money for kind of rigging and loading, uh, and my friends and I drove up to Massachusetts with my drop deck trailer that I restored in a recent video, and actually, in the middle of that video, I mentioned how I had to use the trailer before it was finished to pick up a machine. This was it. This was a great test for that machine at about 4,500 pounds. And probably 100 of those pounds were in old chips and old coolant and lubricant. So my friend George came by and helped me with some of the dirty work. And this was honestly probably like the worst part of this whole process. And this was the part that I was sort of avoiding was cleaning all the gunk goo and getting all the old coolant off of it. Now, one of the things I learned along the way was that a cheap handheld steamer like what you just saw can really help get some of that grease and grime off of the machine. So I used one of those to get that stuff broken free. Now, one of the things I'm going to be doing during this sort of restoration and cleanup is changing out the X ball screw. Now, I reached out to ProtoTrack when I got this machine and was able to get in touch with one of their lead technicians, a gentleman named Aaron, who helped me tremendously on this rebuild. Uh, he spent some time with me on Zoom and gave me some pointers as to what to do and helped me identify all the parts that I needed to actually get this thing back into spec. And one of those parts was the X ball screw. Now, I was a little intimidated to do this. I've worked on bridge ports and stuff like this before. But this machine being a CNC, having different components, I don't know, it just made me a little more nervous. So one of the things that I read in the instruction sheet to replace that ball screw was to pull the table off and make sure it was supported. So lucky for me, I had one of these little Presto lifts that could hold it while I undid the hardware on that sort of captive ball screw nut. I wound up taking the table completely off and it actually was pretty easy to do by myself using that little Presto lift. Now, in order to actually get the ball screw out, I had to actually take the Y ball screw and loosen that so I could get the sort of yoke loosened, and then I could continue the cleaning process inside. Now, I'm going to be using the WD-40 Specialist Degreaser Easy Pods. These things are excellent, and basically what you do here is you drop them into a spray bottle of water. In this case, I'm going to be using two pods, which as you saw earlier is kind of a higher concentration. Basically, just drop these little things in. They're basically a detergent pod. You shake up the bottle and then you make yourself some degreaser. It's a really effective and efficient way to make a high-powered degreaser that worked excellent on this process and on this project to clean up all this gunk and goo. 
As you can see, this machine was pretty well used. I wouldn't say that it was dirtier than any other milling machine I've ever taken apart or cleaned, but it definitely was the most kind of in-depth cleaning job I've ever done to one of my used mills. I took this thing all the way down to the point where I pulled off those oil lines and kind of made sure those all worked correctly as well. You know, the thing when you're using a CNC machine versus a manual mill is that this thing is going to be moving so much more than a manual milling machine would because it's going to be servo controlled. So I want to make sure all my oil lines and everything were super clean. And there are some flexible oil lines that I had to replace that I just used some quarter inch fuel line for. And that worked out pretty well. I was able to get everything that I needed back in place. And you can see the dramatic difference in cleanliness just from a little bit of degreasing and using some toothbrush and other cleaning brushes to get everything nice and cleaned up. I also had to take apart the Y way cover plates and those all get cleaned up as well. Now in order to do all this work, I had loosened all the gibs and ways, and this is going to be a pretty easy kind of, you know, putting back together once I'm all done to make sure everything is nice and tight. And I'll be going through and making sure everything is in spec once I get there. One of the other things that was kind of an issue with this machine, there's a coolant reservoir and pump in the base of the casting, and it had about three gallons of old coolant and oil in it. And let me tell you, it was disgusting. I tried using a drill-powered pump to clean it out, but eventually realized that the only way I was going to get this reservoir clean was by going in there with a coffee cup and paper towels and literally soaking up all that oil until I filled basically a five-gallon bucket filled with old goo. I think it was worth it because that'll be a coolant reservoir I'll use in the future, but man, that was disgusting. Now getting back to the reassembly, I can hook up my flexible oil lines and then I can put the yoke and the X and Y ball screw back inside this machine, but not before putting back together the X way covers. Now these are just pieces of sheet metal with a hole in them and you basically put them in in a sort of pyramid sequence and they just make sure that no chips can get down into the body while you are cutting. This whole process is relatively easy, and I'm really happy that I'm going through it on this machine. This is my first CNC mill like this. I've had other CNC machines, more for woodworking uh, and lasers and stuff like that. I have a CNC plasma, but a CNC mill like this is sort of in a league of its own for me. This is going to allow me to do a lot of different operations and other jobs that I would normally turn down just because they're so complicated to set up on the bridge port, the jet, or the little grizzly that I have. Sometimes you have to use a rotary table and different you know, right angle heads or different indexing tables just to get a part cut. And it can be a really, really laborious sequence just to make a simple piece on a manual mill. With a CNC machine like this, using conversational machining, that the Prototrack KMX controller has, putting programs together without even using my computer is going to be really easy just on the machine itself. It's one of the things that brought me to the Prototrack machine versus some of the other CNC machines you've heard of. The ease of programming and the ease of learning for someone like me who's relatively experienced with machines and using a manual mill but has no idea what I'm doing when it comes to a CNC mill like this. Now this has a 52 inch table, I believe, and it's pretty heavy. So getting it back on without damaging those dovetails was really important. And I had the table there for that as well. And then I could put the gibs and ways back in so that this thing would be nice and tight. Now I assembled the entire table and I put the manual hand wheels back on just to make sure the X and Y ball screws were installed correctly. But really I was gonna be planning for another upgrade so this was kind of just a little temporary to put the X and Y ball screws and the X and Y handles uh, back on. Now, the thing I'm going to be adding back to this are encoder hand wheels. Now, if you're not familiar with the Prototrack encoder hand wheels, you'll notice that they don't actually connect directly to the X and Y ball screw. What they are is essentially a switch disguised as a hand wheel so that you can jog the machine using the servo motors versus actually turning the hand wheel and turning the ball screws by hand. This is a really interesting feature that this machine has, and it's a really cool upgrade for even older Prototrack machines because it gives you access to what's called tracking, which is a program within the KMX CNC controller, and it allows you to basically walk through CNC programs using the hand wheels that you have now uh, that are encoder wheels. 
It also allows you to do positive stops and tracks if you want to mill a certain distance in X or Y. You don't have to use any stop blocks or anything like that. You just tell the DRO how far you want to travel and the wheels will only go that distance based on the feed rate that you have programmed. It really takes all the guesswork out of using hand wheels and it's really a cool upgrade. It's something I never even knew was possible before. Now, in order to get the Y hand wheel on, I had to do some drilling and tapping for some quarter 20 screws, but the X hand wheel popped right on there and you can see that it has a little angle so that you can sort of stand in the same position and run both your X and your Y hand wheel very, very easily. With those installed and this little table on, the next step was to do some calibrating of the machine. Okay, so I just calibrated my X and Y backlash and the way I did that was I had an indicator on the spindle and I zeroed off my indicator, went to zero, lifted the Z and then moved the vise two inches in the direction of the indicator and then exactly two inches back on the DRO. When I got back I lowered the Z back down and I checked the difference between the zero and where I was. In, in this case, the X was 0 .00088 tenths, and then you go into setup, service code 128, and you can set that. So as the machine wears in, I'll have to do this again. Now we're calibrating the X and Y axis. So the service technician, Aaron, really helped me with the X, Y, and Z calibration of this machine. It was really easy. We did it over Zoom, and it was very straightforward. He's extremely knowledgeable, and I can't thank him enough. Prototrack has been excellent in servicing this machine and giving me the information that I needed. They even provided me with the touch-up paint that I needed to make the machine also look well, really good. Now, all of the parts that I installed on this are available uh, directly from Prototrack. If you buy one of these older Prototrack mills, on a website that I'll link down in the description. And I'm really lucky to be able to be working with Prototrack and they provided me with the parts that I put on this machine. So thank you to Prototrack for that. And this machine really has come a long way just by adding a couple of these small parts. In order to paint the machine, I'm using some self-etching primer and then I'm using the factory color paint, uh, the white and the blue to make this thing look super nice. Now, the only thing I don't like about these machines is that factory white color it gets really yellow over time. Every machine that I've seen like this that is anything but brand new yellows. Uh, but the blue paint turned out really nice and I was able to paint everything with just a foam roller, which gave a really nice laid up flat finish and got everything looking really, really clean and new. Everything was really well degreased from that WD-40 degreaser, which helped this paint stick even in the areas that I didn't prime. The only place that I didn't paint with the factory blue paint was inside the oil reservoirs and I went back with some oil-based Rust-Oleum that I could paint in there. It was a little different in color, but I didn't have too much of this paint. I didn't want to waste it in there because it'll probably get destroyed. The other big thing that I wanted to put back on this machine and have brand new. Now on a CNC machine, you really want to have way covers, especially uh, well-performing ones because you're going to be producing so many chips and any of those chips getting stuck and maybe getting past the way wipers can damage your X, Y, or Z surfaces, and you really want to avoid that. So all of these were reinstalled, and this is a very common um, sort of reinstalled and serviceable part on any milling machine you're going to buy, especially if you buy one that's almost 30 years old. Those way covers are going to be disgusting, so definitely look into replacing them if you wind up buying a used machine. The last area to clean was right here on top of sort of the neck of the machine and tighten up those oil lines, clean everything up, and then try to sneak this last Z upper way cover in. Now this was pretty difficult, but I did able to get it back behind that chain. And the reason that chain is there is because you have about a thousand pound counterweight in the column. You can also see the breakout box that I mounted to the side of the column on the left, which is holding all of the guts that gate basically allow the encoder wheels to work. Now, the last upgrade that I'm going to do to this machine was one I purchased on eBay. I liked the power drawbar unit that was on here. Power drawbars are awesome if you've never used one, um, but it was not the best. So I decided since I'm putting all this time, money, and energy into this new machine, to me, I would look around on eBay for a Kurt Power Lock Power Drawbar. And lucky for me, I found this one for about 300 bucks, basically brand new in the box on eBay. And uh, that was a real score. These are about $1,000 each. And this is just a really nice, probably, you know, top tier 
uh, in comparison to what's on the market. It's one of the best power draw bar units that you can buy. It uses an air actuated solenoid and has a self oiling system there where you can adjust how much oil is actually getting to the tool. And you just basically push a little green button and then go in or out. And then a little pneumatic wrench will reach down and grab your drawbar to put in and take out your tooling. This is a 40 taper machine. You can use either CAT40 or NMTB40 tooling. And I also, while I was cleaning things up, painted the little side table. Now, a part that I wanted to make for this machine to compensate for a part that I didn't really like was a little tachometer for the spindle. Now, the upgraded SpeedWrite controller that someone added to the machine is great. It's a five horsepower VFD style controller. I mentioned it in the very beginning of the video, but the problem with it is that the only way to know what the speed is is through this little plastic sight well. It was very difficult to actually read the numbers, especially if the head is raised up. And I want to know what my spindle speed is, especially if I'm using different materials, so I can try to dial it in and also get a consistent spindle speed when I'm using certain materials once I start to learn the machine. Now, this little digital tachometer was cheap on Amazon. I think it was about $13. And then I bought a little plastic project box to put it in. And I went with a 120 volt version of this versus the 12 volt, just because I thought it'd be a little easier to run. Now, once I had cut out the face of the little project box, I was able to drill some holes to run my wires into it. And then I could run my line voltage and my little controller wire right into the tachometer and put this little box together. This is a little cleaner than just sort of sticking the screen onto something. I wanted it in a project box that would also protect it from any coolant or chips uh, so I wouldn't damage any of the connections. The way this works is you've got a little kind of reader that hits a magnet on your spindle. I was testing it over on my drill there and I decided I would mount it right below the little speed controller itself and then I would be able to mount the reader to the head of the machine close to the spindle and I'd be able to know what my spindle speed was whenever I was using it. I did a little bit of cardboard design here by wrapping a little piece of cardboard around the side of the machine where I would use two existing quarter 20 drilled and tapped holes in the head in order to mount the little reader. So in order to get there, I took a little bit of 16 gauge sheet metal and a nibbler. I figured it'd be worth trying out this little cordless Milwaukee nibbler that I've never used to cut this. Now a nibbler is an all right tool for cutting metal, uh, but it doesn't cut curves that well in 16 gauge, especially anything that sharp. So I did wind up having to bust out the bandsaw and basically cut some relief cuts with the nibbler in order to make this sort of curve shape. I designed this on the fly. It doesn't need to be this shape, but it wound up working out pretty nicely. And I thought it looked a little more elegant than just having a straight 45 degree piece. A little curved gusset in there. Looks kind of nice. Next thing to do was to drill this out. It was a little bit under half an inch for the reader. So I just kind of blasted through it and kind of hacked my way through building this piece. It was late at night. I was tired and I really wanted this to be done. I bent it over on the Hosfeld bender and then you can see those two holes. Basically just screwed those in there and then I'm going to stick the reader through the back of it and then it's going to hit a magnet that I have glued to the spindle. This is exactly where it needs to be. I tighten everything up and then tidy up all my wires and this thing is ready to make a test cut. So the first thing I did was face off this one side of the material and then I can go ahead and put it down in the vise and I can use this little Heimer probe that I got to zero it off uh, and then make a little program. Now, like I mentioned with the encoder hand wheels, I can use the Prototrack KMX tracking feature, which is really cool. And it's going to allow me to kind of walk my way through the program to make sure that I've kind of designed it in the right way. Now, I went ahead and programmed basically just like a pocket to mill with a little two flute end mill. And then I used the tracking feature to kind of ghost it above the material for a couple of passes. I wanted to see the path it was going to make, so I set the Z0 a little bit higher than the material. Once that was all ready, I was able to let this thing go in an attempt to cut my first part on the proto track. Starting off, this tool path seemed to be working really well, and I was really excited that I had maybe figured out exactly what I needed to do until I realized I was cutting at full depth, and then... Adios to my end mill. Looks like I'm going to have to spend some time actually learning how to use this, but I'm super excited with the way it came out 
and I really can't wait to spend more time learning this machine and learning how to use the Prototrack KMX controller. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little video. I hope you're excited to learn with me as I learn to do some CNC machining. Thank you to WD-40 Brand for sponsoring this video, and thank you to Prototrack for supplying me with these parts. Also, if you want one of these mugs, you can grab them on my website. See you on the next video.